buonasera. Buongiorno a tutti. Buona puntata di Dialogo di Suono Italia. Veramente in Ciao. Ciao. Buongiorno a tutti, eh, benvenuti a questo nuovo appuntamento dei dialoghi di Urbisaglia. Oggi abbiamo con noi un ospite eh, di eccezione, un ospite speciale, che è Scott Clemons. Buongiorno Scott, good morning Scott. Buongiorno. Eh, Scott è uno dei più importanti e noti collezionisti eh, di libri antichi e in particolare di edizioni eh, aldine della produzione di Aldo Manuzio di tutta la famiglia Manuzio in realtà, non solo di Alto il, il Vecchio, e, e, ma oltre a essere un collezionista è anche uno studioso di cose aldine di, eh, e di storia del collezionismo. Uh, eh, chi è eh, Scott? Eh, Scott ha iniziato a collezionare Aldine quando era uno studente universitario a Princeton, quando studiava Classics, cioè letteratura classica, quindi è un collega, conosce il greco, conosce il latino e, e, e da allora non ha più smesso di, eh, di raccogliere questo prezioso eh, e affascinante materiale. E lui è coinvolto in numerose eh, attività e organizzazioni bibliografiche, eh, tra cui il famoso e prestigiosissimo Grolier Club di New York, di cui è il presidente uscente, eh, ma anche della Bibliographical Society of America, di cui è il tesoriere, e inoltre di una importante istituzione del, per la storia e lo studio del libro antico, come la Rare Book School della University of Virginia, di cui è eh, membro del comitato eh, di selezione e, e sviluppo. Eh, ma oltre a essere un bibliofilo, eh, ovviamente eh, Scott eh, è un, eh, ha un suo proprio lavoro ed è infatti partner di una delle più antiche eh, banche private americane, cioè la Brown Brothers Harry Co. E, tra le tante cose che, lui, eh, che Scott ha fatto, eh, c'è una importantissima mostra curata da lui nel 2015 per il centenario eh, della, eh, della morte di Aldo Manuzio presso il Gloria Club, di cui è uscito un bellissimo catalogo pubblicato dal Gloria Club, che è una delle più belle, anche fisicamente e esteticamente, testimonianze di, eh, del centenario Aldino. Adesso iniziamo la nostra intervista, come sempre in inglese, e, Iniziamo con la prima domanda, che è ovvia. Uh, so, Scott, uh, the first question uh, could seem obvious, but how everything started and why Aldous? Well, Natale, it, it goes back to those undergraduate days in the Princeton Classics Department to which you referred. Uh, as, a, as a young classicist, I was still in my teens at university. I was fascinated by the idea that so much of classical literature had been lost over the years. The fragility of the manuscript tradition and this haunting idea that there were some authors whose entire works were only known through a passing reference from, from some other author, the number of plays of Euripides and Sophocles that we've lost, the works of Aristotle, etc., etc. And so I became interested in the transmission of texts how texts escape that fragility of the manuscript era, find their way into print for the first time. And of course, once multiples are printed, it's easier for a text to survive the depredations of, of uh, careless librarians and fire and floods and things like that. So that's a line of inquiry that leads to Aldus Minucius rather quickly, not so much in the Latin tradition as much as in the Greek tradition. So I was very fortunate at Princeton to be surrounded not only by a, a great special collections, but by great book people as well. People who saw in, in, in me a young uh, amateur scholar at the time and a young collector and who fostered and nurtured that, who introduced me to other collectors, introduced me to, to auction houses, took me to the New York Antiquarian Book Fair, introduced me to the Grolier Club. 
and made sure that I was uh, part of that uh, community. So um, my, my first purchases of the Aldean Press were at the New York Book Fair in the 1980s. And some of those Aldeans sat on, on uh, rickety bookshelves in my college dorm room at Princeton. Um, so I've been, I've been at it ever since and have never run out of things to find that, that interest me to add to the collection. Great. So which was your first purchase? <laughs> So I, w I wish I had it with me to show you. I'm, I'm, I'm up here in upstate Connecticut as opposed to home in New York City uh, where, where we usually live. It was, but I remember vividly, I still have it. I'll never part with it. Um, a 1588, uh, so rather late, edition of Sallust on the Catalinarian Conspiracy. Printed uh, by 1588, Aldous was long dead, uh, but, but Aldous's grandson, also named Aldous, who ran the press, all the way up until his death um, in 1597. So this is very close to the end of the press, but it stood as an example of the press. It had the press mark, the dolphin and anchor on the title page as, as most Aldeans uh, do. And what really interested me about it though, was that on the title page, there were signatures ex libris of previous owners from the 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. No one famous, no one important, no real monetary value to any of them, other than what really spoke to me was the idea that this book that was, you know, at the time 400 years old, had passed through so many hands who had used it, who had loved it, who had underlined things, made marginal annotations, and took the name to write their name in, in usually a year on the title page. And the idea that I, as a, a then 20th century buyer of that book, was adding my own stewardship to that chain of 400 years of stewardship was something that really uh, appealed to me. And I think all collectors of, of antiquarian books know that the books themselves certainly contain history, but the evidence of ownership, the way the books have been used and owned and, and, and loved are themselves history. And, and this book really spoke to me in that regard. So I bought it from a, uh, a, a provincial British dealer, uh, J&J Pisey, who were at the New York Antiquarian Book Four Bear that year. And uh, that was my first book. And I've, uh, I was hooked right out of the gate. Wonderful. So you mentioned that you started in the 80s. So you started, let's say, 30 years ago, collecting um, uh, Aldine rare books. So how how changed the antiquarian book market since you started collecting books? I'm, I mean, I'm talking, of course, both of the uh, uh, international and uh, uh, national yeah. American antiquarian book market. Yeah. Well, in, in, in some ways, it's radically unrecognizable now versus what it was. In some ways, it hasn't changed. It, it, it's very interesting. When I, when I was still at university, I um, got a call from a, um, a, a very uh, distinguished book dealer in New York City who invited me to have um, uh, lunch, and we had lunch. And he spent the entirety of lunch trying to talk me out of collecting the Aldine Press. And the rationale was that all the great Aldines were gone, that I really should have started collecting in the 1950s and 1960s, because that's when all the great collections were, were opening up and there were great sales. And, and uh, you know, I mean, to me, I didn't ignore the advice, but I feel like the Aldine Press chose me as much as I chose it. It wasn't as if I scientifically set out to figure out what would be the right thing to collect. It's a passion and you can't explain passion. What I've been delighted to find, though, is that that distinguished book dealer, who I think out of a noble intent tried to steer me to something that would be less frustrating, was wrong. Because there are fabulous books out there. Even though the Aldine Press has been collected since the ink was still drying on the page, there are still wonderful books to be found, wonderful association copies, wonderful provenance, wonderful bindings, wonderful what I think of as tributaries of the press. And so I have never grown frustrated or stale in that collection. Of course, the biggest change has been the internet, which has served a couple of purposes. One, it makes it in some ways easy to find um, routine copies of books because you can go to any one of a number of rare book aggregate sites and, and just search uh, for them or the, the, the sort of aggregator auction sites that bring together you know, smaller auction houses from around the world that I would never run across as a, as a collector. 
So in some ways that's made it uh, easier. In another way, it's also made it easier for books to find me. And one of the benefits of the exhibition that I did at the Grolier Club in 2015 is uh, that it, it made a lot of people aware of what I was collecting. And a lot of dealers subsequent to that have reached out to me and said, you know, we've never met and you don't know me, but, but uh, you know, I'm a dealer and I have these books, would you be interested in this? I remember when I did the exhibition, some of the members of the Grolier Club said, aren't you worried that you're going to be inundated with offers from dealers now? And to which my response was, that's part of my hope. I'm looking forward to being inundated with offers from dealers now. So the collection, Natale, has grown to the extent that since that exhibition closed in 2015 to today, so five years later, I could probably remount that entire exhibition again and not use any of the same books twice and tell the same story. So um, I'm delighted by that. And I feel like this is a collection that I will never outgrow. And, and indeed, I've bought a few books since I've been quarantined up here in upstate Connecticut and, and was offered a book just this morning when I got up this morning and read my email and had an offer from a book dealer of, uh, in, in Europe. So uh, we continue apace, uh, the coronavirus notwithstanding. It's basically what uh, is fascinated the fascinating element of collecting which is not only something like monolithic which is um uh, it, which never changes but on the contrary which change the interest change uh, uh constantly and as you say the, the, the taste in the past was different and you mentioned that before your interest in uh, ownership annotation provenances which is also a major uh, topic in the scholarship of uh, related to book history uh, and circulation of knowledge so this was fascinating Th thinking about uh, a kind of genealogy of uh, book collecting as you said uh, before so this um, change of ownership which is not only a matter of uh, 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 selling and purchasing book but also uh, the, the a testimony of the change of the interest on the same topic so this would be a, a very uh, interesting uh, topic to develop I, yeah. what do you think about it well to make the obvious observation books are portable they are meant to move. And indeed, one of the contributions that Aldous Minutius made to the world of the book was to begin printing great literature in a format, the octavo format, that was even more portable, that could easily be carried around as opposed to a very large folio that, you know, you wouldn't uh, necessarily travel with. So Aldous contributed to this idea of portability. So books are made to move. The way they move, from whose hands, into whose hands, under what circumstances, even down to the nitty gritty of, of what the books may have cost when they were purchased or sold, how they were rebound, how they were annotated, how they were used, tells a far richer story about how we as a civilization both capture and preserve and transmit knowledge. And that expresses itself in so many different ways, the bindings of books, the annotations within books, obviously. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of the book as a, as a physical artifact and the, the meta stories that it has to tell far beyond whatever the text is itself. I'm certainly interested in the text as a classicist, but if I just wanted a good copy of Homer to read, you can buy a good copy of Homer in the Oxford Classical Text for 40 or $50. But the way that Homer has been read and used and analyzed and interpreted and digested in some ways over the subsequent 500 years, that to me is a story that we're just in the early stages of being able to tell. And uh, many scholars uh, right now deal uh, with this um, very fascinating topic uh, is the marginalia studies. No, yeah. we had... Uh, uh, the pleasure of interviewing, I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a couple of weeks ago, Anthony Grafton, who spoke about his interest in marginalia and, and in, the, uh, in, in the development of this kind of, uh, of studies now. 
So, but now jumping uh, in the present day. So unfortunately right now for you seems for, uh, as for everybody, the situation, the current situation is uh, kind of critic and uh, doesn't allow to pursue our work, our job in the right way and our passions too. What are you doing now as a collector in the, uh, in the present day, staying uh, isolated in your, in your home? Well, so when we uh, left New York City to come up to upstate Connecticut, we're about 100 miles north of New York City. It was actually just a few days after the New York Book Fair came to an end. That was actually one of the last big uh, public gatherings that I was at before we sort of went into self-imposed uh, physical distancing. But you'll be very amused by this. As we were loading the car to leave New York City, my wife, who is a musician, insisted on bringing uh, um, a guitar and a couple of violins and a couple of mandolins. She's a music teacher, so she needed these things to just to, to work remotely. And, and, and I, of course, packed a couple of boxes of books that I wanted to work on and research and read. And, and I think we threw one bag of clothes in the car as well. But most of the back of the car were books and musical instruments, which struck me as a very um, um, Boccaccio-esque way to escape the city for the country for our own uh, version of, uh, of the Decameron. But um, so I brought a number of things with me that I've been working on, some provenance uh, mysteries that I'm still trying to solve. And I would say, thank goodness for the internet, because so much uh, uh, resources on the internet are available that I'm able to do a great deal of the work that I do without access to my reference library in New York. Not, not all of it, I'm not, that's not a perfect substitution. And uh, thank goodness for the internet because dealers are still able to offer me books and there are still auctions taking place. And it's not the same not to be able to go and physically inspect a book, but it's not quite business as usual, but it's something close to business as usual. So the collection continues to grow, maybe not at the pace that it would under normal circumstances, but it hasn't really held me back. So um, speaking about internet and the power of this uh, almost new tool. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were protagonist, you were protagonist uh, of, a, <laughs> of a funny chain, uh, some one started, I don't know when, which library, of related to sharing a book binding, an anonymous or a, an identified book binding, right. just for the pleasure of uh, uh, showing it and uh, um, and uh, sharing the uh, uh, the fascinating uh, uh, a fascinating image and when you uh, share your um, your image uh, a great uh, number of uh, scholars and uh, uh, connoisseur of uh, uh, the uh, book by me history started to uh, try to figure out what was your uh, uh, that book binding. Can can you show yeah. us? God bless God bless the internet. So this was a book that I bought at the New York Book Fair. It's the Aldine edition of Quintilian. So you can see the author's name uh, on the upper cover, rather finely bound. Uh, the, the the date of the text is fifteen twenty one. Uh, the binding is contemporary, maybe a generation later, but it's mid-16th century at the latest. And what fascinated me about this is that on the lower cover, there is a, um, um, an initial, an abbreviation of what was almost certainly the owner's name who commissioned this binding. It's a rather nice binding. Uh, there are, uh, we're aware of four or five other bindings on Aldine imprints that have the similar sort of author's name on the upper cover and that rondel and the same kind of frame on the lower cover, this initial IA and then an OB at the end with a little squiggle over the top that indicates um, some sort of elision. So uh, it's Quintilian on the art of rhetoric. So it's a fabulous text, but this is also a text that was clearly owned by someone in the 16th century who had the means to have books finely bound and also had the taste to collect as a book collector. 
So today, book collectors are, are you know, all, all over the place. But in the 16th century, the idea of owning and collecting a book as an artifact in and of itself was still very much in its infancy. Uh, Jean Grolier, after whom the Grolier Club is named, is sort of the patron saint of early collectors who collected for the sake of the beauty of the physical artifact. So I know, and I've done some research already, that great binding scholars like Miriam Foote and Anthony Hobson um, are aware of these kind of bindings and have been unable to identify who IAOB was. Whoever it was, he had to have run in humanist circles. He had to have been uh, a known entity in the time. And some nights as I'm up here in self-imposed quarantine, I lie awake at night wondering who IAOB was and hoping that at some point I'll be able to trace him down through provenance research and identify a previously unidentified great collector of the Aldine Press, probably in the mid 16th century, probably either in Italy or in France. So another protagonist of this genealogy of collectors, as you say. And this uh, explanation you made, this um, reconstruction, this uh, uh, love for not only collecting, but also uh, knowing and sharing the knowledge about your books is something that was um, was the focus of a, a, an, an interview made uh, in our series, uh, the Dialoghi di Urbisaglia, last week with another uh, refined, important Italian collector, who is Paolo Piezzi Maestri, mm -hmm. who he spoke about the cultural mission of collectors, not only the pleasure of collecting, but also this sense of uh, self-commitment with uh, uh, the general public to share and spread the book culture, but also the culture in general. So he, he said that collectors usually uh, can, not usually, but they can be just people who collect stuff and for their own pleasure. But he thinks um, that collecting is much more, collecting rare books is much more. And I think that with your many uh, activities at the Glory Club, but not only, uh, you are on the same page of Paolo. Well, I, I, every great book collector I've ever known has felt a um, obligation is too strong of a word, a privilege is a better word, of stewardship and of, of sharing the passion and the interest. So the notion that I think maybe a lot of people have as, of collectors as being hermits almost who, who have these beautiful objects, uh, whether they're books or paintings or sculptures or whatever they are, that they, they're jealous of and that, that they keep hidden away so that only they can enjoy them. I, I have never found that in the world of books. The conviviality and the fellowship is, is thick. The other interesting thing that I've seen again and again and again is the contribution that private scholarship can make to the public discourse. When we mounted our exhibition in 2015 on the Aldine Press at the Grolier Club, I very much wanted to build that exhibition as much as possible with copies that were owned by private collectors. Most of them came from my own collection, but there were other private collectors who contributed items to that exhibition as well. And the subtext or the story that I wanted to tell was precisely this one, that private collectors have a role to play in public scholarship. We certainly borrowed some pretty spectacular provenance copies from the Morgan Library, from Princeton, from Columbia University, institutions very uh, close, the, the Williams Museum uh, in, in Massachusetts. But other than that, I think of 140 items in the exhibition, I think 132 came off of private shelves. And it's, it's it, the story behind that as well is if you look at the generations of scholarship, whether it's our, our unknown friend here in the 16th century or Jean Grolier himself also in the 16th century, all the way through today, behind every great public institution, there is private uh, benefaction. 
either people who write large checks of the institution can thrive or collectors who donate their collections or donate their time or donate their scholarship. This conversation between institutions and individuals, it's not a contrarian type conversation. They're not mutually exclusive. They're very beneficial to each other. I've certainly seen that in my own uh, life as a collector uh, and, and, and the friends that I have at institutions and the institutions that I support. And I, I, I'm, I feel very passionate about that contribution that private scholarship has already made and will continue to make in the future. And speaking of, of this, do you have do you, do you have now in mind some new um, activities, some new enterprise in this in this term, like exhibitions or catalogs or other or books maybe? I'm very interested. I think I referred earlier to sort of tributaries of the Aldean Press. There are some aspects of the press that I think don't receive the kind of scholarly attention that they deserve. And, and it may be because they're such narrow areas that, that they don't really just attract attention. I'm fascinated by the early counterfeits of the Aldine Press. Um, in the early 16th century, there were a number of counterfeiters operating mostly in, in, in France, beyond the reach of the Venetian Senate, who would uh, copy all this is italic type, who would copy the text themselves, who in some cases, would even put them in Italian-esque bindings to make them look real. I'm fascinated by what that has to say about the early concept of intellectual property and copyright law in an era in which there really was no such thing as copyright law. Um, so I'm fascinated by that aspect of the press. I'm fascinated by later uh, family members in the Aldine family who printed outside of Venice, who printed in Paris, who printed in Bologna even for a while, or in Rome. I'm fascinated by the very end of the press. So Aldous founded the press, started printing in 1496. He passed away in 1515. His in-laws and then his son took over the press. And then a third generation, his grandson, Aldous Younger, took over the press. And the press didn't finally close its doors until Aldous Jr.'s death in 1597. Quite, a, quite a, a, a track record of business management, by the way. And how the press came to an end uh, fascinates me as well. So these are areas that don't get a whole lot of scholarly attention, but that I'm uh, very interested in uh, pursuing as well. Whether or not it leads to some monographs, probably will, or an exhibition, hopefully. I, I, would, I would hope so at some point. But in the meantime, I keep uh, uh, beavering away and understanding even more about a printer and a businessman and a scholar and an academic and a printer and an editor. Uh, all this minutiae that's fascinated me since I was uh, a young man of 18 years old. And we look forward to seeing the products of this great passion of yours. Um, so let's say that uh, we don't have, unfortunately, uh, more, uh, any more time. I wanted to deeply thank you for sharing uh, your your passion, your books, uh, your ideas uh, with us. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Thank you, uh, Grazie. Dialoghi, questo, questo uh, episodio dei dialoghi di Urbisaglia uh, termina qui. Uh, vi do appuntamento, come sempre, al prossimo dei nostri, uh, dei nostri dialoghi, sempre sul canale dei libri. Grazie e a presto. Thank mm -hmm. you.